Thank you so much for staying with us. Time now for our Beyond the Scars conversation. Uh, we'll be having it just shortly, but remember, you can engage us at on our social media platforms at KTN is KE at Grace Career KE. You can also call in live at some point in the conversation. Uh, but today I'm glad to have my guests with me in studio, Honorable Elizabeth Wangoinje, uh, brand ambassador for Vitiligo Karibusana, uh, Clinton Ontita, who is the Mr. Albinism in Kenya 2018, and Grace and Zomo HR and IC Bank. Karibuni Sana, thank you so much for joining us. We're also expecting Julie Nas Nasuju, she'll be joining us um, shortly. Uh, but Wongo, I want to start with you because, uh, of course, I had to do some bit of background, you know, some research mm -hmm. on you. And I found out that, you know, this condition, Vitiligo, you were not born like that, right? Mm -hmm. no. So if you could, take, if you could mm -hmm. take us back to those years. Um, I got Vitiligo when I was 14 years. Mm -hmm. I was at Pangani Girls. Mm -hmm. My Let's best talk friend. about before 14. You just before 14, I was child. normal. Mm -hmm. I didn't have Vitiligo at all. Mm -hmm. I was born normal, no patch. I didn't have any patch mm -hmm. of vitiligo mm -hmm. when I was born. Mm -hmm. I was normal like everyone else, just like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, 14. so when I was in Form 2 at Pangani Girls, uh, my deskmate came and told me I have chalk on my eye here. Yeah. And uh, we decided to go to the washrooms and try wiping it off. We tried wiping it off, it didn't go off. So in the evening, I went to the nurse and I told the nurse, um, I have this patch that is, is not chalk and it's not going away. So the nurse called my parents. The next day my parents came for me, went to hospital and the doctor said I have vitiligo. Mm -hmm. I was given medication, I started using medication. But then after it got, when I used the medication, the patch here went. Then another patch came on my back. So we went back to the doctor. He gave us the same medication. I used it for a while, for two years. Uh, they just, I started getting patches on my body, mm -hmm. even though I was using the medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but at first, at 14, when they told you you had vitiligo, did you even understand, you know, no, what I, that is? I didn't even know what vitiligo is. Neither did my parents. Mm -hmm. So my, my mom basically did um, the normal thing a mom will do. She started giving me a diet, <clears throat> excuse me, a diet that was of carrot juice and tomato juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll be getting back to you, Angoy. Mm -hmm. uh, Clinton, this is where I will be in the conversation. Yes. Once again, Karibu Sana. Let's Thank start you. with your story, you know, from back in the day, how you were born, raised. Yeah. Um, my name is Antita Clinton. I'm born and raised in Kisei. Um, throughout uh, my growing up, I've been through um, mainstream education. Um, I didn't attend any schools, and for me, I found that it was... Um, a bit of a challenge because you know when the teachers um, come to class they teach as everybody else would teach without considering the fact that I could not see the blackboard properly and um, due to my short uh, eyesight yes. so until primary school high school I've been in main schools and um, mainstream schools and um, for me I'd say um, it, it's a very good thing because it helped me um, challenge myself a bit more so that I could bring out the best in me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I'll be getting back to that, especially, I assume it really had to be challenging, especially being, you know, in mainstream schools and all that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Grace, Karibu Zana. Thank you. Um, I was born and raised in Nairobi, and I actually have a sister with albinism. She's four years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So when I was born, of course, my parents didn't understand what albinism was, but at least my mom sort of had an idea that we should stay away from the sun, we should protect our skin, and our eyes should be protected. Mm -hmm. So when I went to school, primary school, and to Thicker Christian School, she would tell the teachers that, yes, this, she can't see well, so she needs to sit in front of the class to be able to see well. Um, the teachers need to write legible letters on the board, and I needed to not speak up when I can't see well. Now I needed to speak up. Yeah, yeah so in high school, um, I went to Moy Girls. It was sort of an integrated school. So they didn't, um, they had a visually impaired section, sort of. So there was a girl who was totally blind, like 98% blind. So they grouped me in that category that, yes, I cannot see so well, so I am blind. And I had to learn Braille. That was in high school. So it was a bit tough, but then my mom really encouraged me and she told me, well, it's just a stumbling block. And after four years, of course, you won't have to use it. And then, of course, now in university, I, don't, I didn't use it at all. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my experience in high school. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll be getting back to you again, Grace. Uh, Wangoi, so you said the first time you know, this appeared was at 14, and then it sort of disappeared and then appeared back at 
your neck is behind my neck right so just take us through what transpired after that <clears throat> that was in i was 19 years mm -hmm. um and then he said now coming on the tips of my fingers mm -hmm. and on the tips of my toes uh, we tried the tomato juice, curry juice medication. It really helped. There's a time it will disappear, then come back, disappear, then come back. That's the challenge you have with vitiligo. Today you might be white, and then the next time you meet me, my melanin has come back. Mm -hmm. So we did that for two years. And then I told my mom, I used to go for phototherapy at Kenyatta. And um, there's a day I became really sick because of phototherapy. Mm -hmm. Yet um, it kills most of my white blood cells, and I end up falling sick, falling sick every single time. So when I went to see another doctor, the doctor told me to stop using the phototherapy machine. So I stopped and then I, that's the day I told my mom, let's no longer do medication on vitiligo. If it's gonna come back, it will come back naturally. Actually, that's what most doctors say. It's not treatable, but it's manageable. But actually vitiligo comes back on itself. Your skin color just starts showing itself, starts coming back by itself. So at 22, I decided to join politics. Um, I used to be a banker then, and nobody would come to my teller. So I'd feel really bad because people would come to your teller or on Tita's teller and never come to mine. So I decided to join Main Street Politics and be a youth representative then. So I went to the National Alliance Party and um, I started taking photographs of um, the, anyone who'd do campaigns in Nyeri County. I started taking photographs and that's how I ended up being an MCA. And then when I entered to be an MCA, I actually was you know vitiligo, you, I was dotted, my face was dotted, so it was white, it was dots of black and white, and my whole body was I'd actually turned fully white apart from my face. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Wangoye, I feel you're taking us a little bit too fast, <laughs> but I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll just guide you according okay. to how I want the conversation to be, because mm -hmm. I want to take you back again now okay. to 14 and 19, 19, still a teenager, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, you know, the spots are appearing and disappearing. What is going through mm. your mind as a child still, you know, are you understanding, mm. are you comprehending what's happening to you? No, I couldn't understand and it was tough for me. It was really, really tough, especially when people would ask what's happening to you and you tell them it's vitiligo and no one knows what vitiligo is. Mm -hmm. um, I went for counselling because by the time I got that, by the time I was 19, I actually had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. But then now they told me I don't know what's going on with you. so. You're not gonna do this. Mm -hmm. Imagine at 19 and um, you're just coming out to face the world. What does it do to you? What does Vitilly go to me? No, 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 no. <laughs> when uh, your boyfriend at 19 said. I went for counseling. Actually, when they told me that, I really. It broke me. Mm -hmm. It broke me so bad. And um, I went for counseling for three months. And um, even before I got to 19, I was still going for counseling just to be told and understand that this is just a condition. You don't have to feel low about it. You don't have to accept society perceptions about it and when someone says that because people will shout sneering bad words or abuses when you're walking so I was being taught on how to handle such situations and I come across them mm -hmm. yeah okay uh, Clinton <coughs> if I could take you back to your days in school yes and uh, you actually told us of being in mainstream schools meaning you were with you know other uh, students that are regarded you know just to be just like everybody else right yes. And uh, you talked about the challenges you had, especially with your sight and all. But how was it interacting with other children who probably don't even know? No, before we actually even get to interacting with other children, how was it for yourself accepting the kind of you know condition that you are in? Um, okay, growing up um, as a person living with albinism, um, in the past there wasn't um, much knowledge about this condition. Um, especially when I was young, I'd say um, I could always go and play in the sun. I was being told you should not be in the sun for long, but then kids will always be kids. So I'll go play in the sun. Then when, it, when I come back in the evening, um, I have sunburns all over, and it was really excruciating pain. Yeah, so after that, I further proceeded to high school. At least that's where I kind of got to understand much more on what albinism really entails. Yes. So take us now through dealing with other, you know, your classmates. Yes. Um, the teachers. Uh. Okay, being, being in mainstream since um, primary school <coughs> all the way to secondary school, I think somewhere along the way um, I fit in. I didn't see myself as any other different um, than they were. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, how about them? You know, how they would, would they treat you differently, you know, from other students? Mm, of course, um, you know, personalities are different. 
So um, you'd find that um, some people would associate with me, others wouldn't. But um, I think for me, I kind of learned to strike a balance. And um, whatever somebody didn't, uh, wasn't um, ready to associate with me, um, I guess I kind of got adapted to the fact that it's not really necessary for me to um, to, to get acceptance from everybody, you know. Um, they say for um, um, for self-actualization, you first need to accept yourself, then others can accept yes. you. Yes. Yes, that's yes. So that's what you did. Yes. Right. Okay. Grace Mawango um, here tells us of an experience she had with you know a boyfriend at 19 who left her because of the condition. I want to know how. For you it was. I don't know if you had a boyfriend. I don't know how your relation was with, you know, your peers. Um, well, let me go back to primary. Mm -hmm. uh, primary, the mm -hmm. people around me, the students basically, uh, they were more of fascinated than bullying. Because wow. <laughs> we had, you know, in primary we had a white principal. Mm -hmm. So they thought I was her <coughs> daughter. So they were more of fascinated. They'd be like, oh, can you feel pain? They'll just ask this out of the world questions. Are you okay? Can I pinch you? Can I touch your skin or something? So primary, they were very fascinated. Mm -hmm. High school, I guess because of the support I got at home, I normally say that the environment at home really helps a child be confident and see themselves as something outside there. Because if you're not accepted at home, then outside no one will accept you because you really have that low confidence. Mm -hmm. So I never really felt different when I was at home because my parents treated me normally. They would well, discipline me in any way they needed to. Mm -hmm. So I really had that high self-confidence and the high self-esteem. and. One thing also, so the world takes you at your estimate. So the way you see yourself is the way the world sees you. Mm -hmm. So in high school also the students really were okay. They were just, they would help me because I'll speak up. Also another thing I tell other people with albinism, no one can see, can really fit in your shoes to see how you see. So you have to speak up when you can't see so well or when you need some help, you can, you have to speak up because no one will see what you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me it was basically a journey of self-acceptance and then now other people are able to accept me because I did that myself mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. okay uh Wangoi, again as i said you know I've, I've conducted research on largely almost all of you but uh, i remember you also mentioned some of the challenges you experienced like when you were a teller you know in a bank and uh, mm -hmm. customers would queue you know at other tellers even when you were not busy mm -hmm. just take us through that and maybe some of the other challenges that you faced i think that's one of the biggest challenges i faced mm -hmm. when working at the bank mm -hmm. Um, some of the other challenges people living in Italy, not only may face, is when looking for jobs. Even if you're qualified, you'll find that um, I'll go. You've applied, I've applied. We go, we get the... I've, I, did, I've, I did, I think, a million interviews by the time I was called to the bank. Mm -hmm. And I'd qualify, they'd tell me, but now we don't know what's going on with your face, you know. And those are the challenges we face with employers out there. Mm -hmm. Also, the snide comments people say, uh, you'll find someone saying, were you cursed? Were you thrown on acid? Mm -hmm. Um, is it a bad omen? Is it a disease? You know, it's not a disease, it's just a condition. And I tend to tell people that vitiligo is not, it's not um, contagious. I can greet you and you get vitiligo. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the challenges we face are just uh, the perceptions of people out here and the fact that there's no awareness about vitiligo and we've tried to do awareness, but people still don't really understand what vitiligo mm -hmm. is. So the challenges we face are just perceptions of people. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the the hardest challenges I've had to face. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took, it's taken me, it took me eight years mm -hmm. to actually accept that I'm living with vitiligo mm -hmm. and gain my confidence, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and uh, you mentioned greeting and I remembered again, I saw that, you know, people had issues even shaking hands with you. Yes, especially children. Um, it's, uh, till today, I don't find it hard, but nowadays I have an answer for children. Mm -hmm. When they don't wanna say hi, I'm normally like, high five. And then they ask me what happened to your face, I'm like, um, you know, when you eat a lot of sugar, you'll turn white. <laughs> and so it becomes a very great conversation. And then I tell the parents, oh, that's not the reason. Mm -hmm. Then now the child will be like, mom, I won't eat sugar, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, Which is a good thing. <laughs> yes. So you'll find most people don't want to say hi, and you just walk away. Mm -hmm. What will you do mm, if true. someone doesn't want to say hi? Mm -hmm. So especially for adults, I find that very rude. Mm -hmm. Because as an adult, it's, that's arrogant, sorry, ignorance. You should go out there and just, you know, check what this is.
Okay, okay. You also talked about missing out on job opportunities. Yeah. When you go back home after missing that opportunity, what, mm. what goes through your mind? It's tough. It's tough when you go back home and you realize, yes, I'm qualified, and this is a job that I can actually do, do and they're not picking me because of something that is beyond me. Mm -hmm. It's really, really tough. You have to do a, a lot of self-talk. I normally talk to myself a lot and tell myself, it's not about you and it's not about you, it's about them. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't want your expertise in their company. And it's, it's not about me at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And you have to really encourage yourself. And persons living with Vitiligo, it's tough for someone to talk to you. It's tough for you to talk to yourself mm -hmm. and tell yourself, you know what, it's not about who I am, it's about them. And it's not because I cannot do it, it's about them not accepting me because of something that I didn't choose to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough though. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're getting, of course, to the part where you go beyond your scars now uh, after the break. But uh, before we take a break, Clinton, our you know brothers and sisters in Tanzania are having a really hard time, right? Yes. Uh, we read in the papers, see on the news, you know, uh, people believing that their body parts, you know, have something special, and uh, they really go through a lot. Have you ever experienced that? And uh, if not, what does that make you feel? You know what our brothers and sisters from Tanzania are going through? Um, okay, back, I remember it was back in the years about 2009, 2010, 2011. That is when the cases were really rampant of um, persons with albinism being used for ritual mm -hmm. killings and sacrifices and all. Um, what I'd like to say for Kenya, um, we've made strides um, with regards to creating awareness, I can say we are a bit ahead. But what I can add, um, my Tanzanian friends and families and brothers and sisters, is that um, albinism is not um, is not a source of um, income for anyone. In that um, our parts have any value, we're just all we're lacking. Actually, albinism is. Um, a genetic condition caused by lack of um, melanin, mm. which is uh, responsible for pigmentation in the yeah. yeah in the skin, eyes, and um, hair. Hair, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, what you can tell your, you know, colleagues from uh, Tanzania? Yes, um, what I can say is, uh, it is very crucial for people to be aware that um, albinism is just a genetic condition and that. There's nothing really monetary attached to body parts of persons with living with albinism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Grace? Um, such cases where people with albinism are abducted and now their body parts are taken away are very rampant in areas where there's low, how do you say, education, awareness as well. Because when you are educated and you, we all go through biology in Form 3 where we learn about albinism and it's just a genetic issue. So I would encourage, of course, now Tanzania to make more strides in creating awareness about albinism because once people are aware that it is just the lack of melanin, that's all. There's no monetary gain by taking my bones or taking anything because if there was, I myself, since I possess the bones, <laughs> I'll be a billionaire by now. So yes, basically just awareness is really needed to be increased in those areas where these, they're very, those remote areas where they don't really go to school, they believe, they have strong cultural beliefs, mm -hmm. that happens in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. So that's why their mind is really closed up in believing that yes, my bones can give someone, can make someone have power or more money and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and while we are at it, Bangoy, uh, Vitiligo basically being the cells responsible uh, for pigmentation being destroyed, right? But uh, at least mm -hmm. at this age, I believe you know more about it. You know, it's not like when you were 14 yeah. or 19. Mm -hmm. So for that viewer who probably does not pretty much understand what Vitiligo is all about, mm -hmm. uh, could you help them? Um, vitiligo is a condition where your antibodies fight your melanin cells, mm -hmm. so your melanin cells cannot be able to produce uh, the, melan the color on your skin. Mm -hmm. So that's why we end up turning white. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not a condition that is treatable, it's something that is manageable. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's what vitiligo is. Okay. And of course, uh, as I did mention, we'll be having Julie uh, back on set uh, after we take the break. But Bungo, uh, I want to stick with you. And uh, you mentioned you're now into politics. You're a nominated MCA, mm. right? Mm. How has it been? <laughs> I was a nominated MCA 2013 2017 at the Nyeri County Assembly. Um, it was a beautiful journey. That's where I got to accept myself, and that's where I started helping persons living with vitiligo in Kenya. Uh, I actually passed a bill in the Nyeri County Assembly that says, in case the national government does not give up, oh, sorry, 
also persons living with vitiligo are, are supposed to use sunscreen mm -hmm. and lip balm yes. because um, when they go under the sun it's kind of affects their skin. Mm -hmm. So when I was in the county assembly, I passed a motion and a bill that says that in case the national government does not produce, does not give us sunscreen or is not able to give us sunscreen at this particular time, mm -hmm. the county government should come in and uh, give sunscreen and uh, purchase sunscreen for persons living both with vitiligo and albinism. Mm -hmm. And um, entering into politics opened doors, even not for myself only, but for persons living with vitiligo in Kenya. Mm -hmm. they are, in government they accepted more mm -hmm. and also um, just creating the awareness and meeting people with vitiligo and talking to them and telling them you know what it's not your skin color you can be who you, you can be who you really want to be in life mm -hmm. just be courageous enough to go out there it's tough it's tough let me tell you grace it is tough for someone living with vitiligo mm -hmm. who was once normal to just accept it yes. it's really tough yes. and um, I normally just meet with them I encourage them I tell them it also took me eight years it's, a, it's not something that you wake up one day and say no I'm courageous no it took me eight it took years eight years eight years to wow. accept I am living with this condition mm -hmm. and if I do not accept it then I won't live to my full potential and if I didn't accept I was living with vitiligo probably I wouldn't have helped as much people as I've done in the past five years sure. I've, I've been able to distribute sunscreen to 3,500 people mm -hmm. living with my condition and just talk to them and encourage them. Okay. And you can see they're going out there and they're trying their best to actually just come out. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So we need to take a short commercial break now, but do stay with us. Remember, after the break, we're back with Julie Nasuju. She's actually here. I see her. Uh, but also Clinton and uh, Grace will be sharing, you know, how their stories of how they got beyond their scars. Continue sending in your feedback. I see it at uh, Grace Kureke at KTNUSK. You can also call in live after the break just to sending, you know, your contribution regarding the conversation we are having. Do stay with us.